Okay, I give you a little pre-lecture before we get on with the real lecture. So these are a couple plates from Vesalius, who is sometimes considered the father of modern anatomy. And uh, he actually got in trouble with some of his fellow anatomists uh, because he declared that there were some mistakes in the work of Galen. Galen was a Roman physician, and uh, Vesalius didn't live till the 1500s, and so nothing had been written about anatomy from the fall of Rome to the 1500s. And so that was the text. And uh, so Vesalius said, well, there's some things that aren't right in Galen's text. And people got furious at him, including a guy by the name of Jacobus Silvius. Remember the Fisher of Silvius? He declared him a madman. And he said, if there's, there's anything that's different between what you're seeing and what Galen wrote about, it's because bodies must have changed since Galen wrote his text. So people love their mentors and their texts, but it uh, turns out Galen did make some mistakes. All right. Okay. Uh, let's pick up where we left off last time. And where we left off last time, uh, we were talking about the olfactory system. Again, we didn't see the olfactory nerve uh, because it's all these little tiny branches. And they go up and they synapse in the olfactory bulb, which we actually have seen now several times. And we talked about the fact that a lot of these axons leaving the olfactory bulb will be doing so via the lateral olfactory stria or tract. Lateral olfactory stria or tract. And we also talked about the fact that this lateral olfactory stria or tract will end up synapsing here in this piriform cortex, which this artist has stippled uh, gray, and here on this side, this artist has uh, shown you, they've, what they've done is grab this piriform cortex, which in us is rolled kind of medially relative to a sheep. They've grabbed it and yanked it out lateral, so you can see all the various parts of it. So you can see there's the primary olfactory area, and the, the entorhinal cortex gets some input, and as I'll talk about here shortly, so does the amygdala. And then I believe the last slide that I showed last time, uh, this showed this drawing of a human brain. And here we can see the olfactory bulb. And there is a medial olfactory stria, or tract, too. So if there's a lateral, of course, there's a medial. And this medial olfactory stria, or tract, goes in to form part of this structure, and this structure here is the anterior commissure, which you now have seen, right? Yes, okay. So what's that anterior commissure connect? No factory bulbs, and what else? Amygdala and parts of the temporal lobe. Okay, to review the olfactory system in the sheep, things that we can see readily on the outside. So again, here are the olfactory bulbs. This is what kind of view of the brain is this? Ventral. Yeah, I hope you know that by now. Uh, okay, and here, tracing this fissure here, this is the rhinal fissure, which is a feature that you find, I believe, on every last mammalian brain. You'll find a rhinal fissure. And so, again, here is the lateral olfactory tract, these axonal tracts here. And they're going to end up in this piriform, which means pear-shaped cortex, there on the ventral brain, ventral telencephalon. Okay, and piriform cortex is involved in what? Smell and memory. We'll get back to all those things. Okay, this is a plate from some work by a famous neuroanatomist. Uh, Santiago Ramoni Cajal. And uh, Cajal's, in Cajal's day, people thought 
that the cytoplasm of all neurons was continuous, that there weren't any gaps, they weren't separate cells. And the reason that they thought that was you can't see a synapse with a light microscope. You still can't see a synapse with a light microscope. They're too darn small. So people believed that the axons became continuous with the dendrites and the cytoplasm just kept flowing and it was a big syncytium, a big network. In fact, a synapse wasn't seen until electron microscopes were developed and by cosmic coincidence when, on the day I was born, way back in the middle of the last century, people finally saw a synapse, but they had to use an electron microscope to do it. But people believed that there were synapses before there were electron microscopes. And actually, Cajal was the one who advanced this belief. And this belief has a, a name. It's called the Neuron Doctrine. And uh, what Cajal did was he used a technique that's called the Golgi technique. You ever hear of this Golgi guy? Golgi bodies guy? Okay, so Golgi developed this technique which uses uh, silver to stain neurons. And in this technique, a small proportion of neurons will take up this stain. And to this day, we don't know why some neurons will take up this stain and other neurons won't. But when they do take up this stain, every last aspect of the neuron will stain black. So you'll see the cell body, you'll see the whole dendritic tree, and you'll see the axons. The whole, the whole cell will stain. And so what Cajal was able to do was he was just an amazing histologist, and he would take section after section after section after section, and he'd trace those axons and trace those axons, and he always came to an end. And so he said, it doesn't make sense to me that I always come to an end if the cytoplasm is supposed to be continuous. Why do I always come to an end? Neurons must be different cells rather than a continuous cell. So he met up with somebody in England, uh, Sir Charles Sherrington, who was a physiologist, and Sir Charles also had a bunch of data that said there's got to be gaps between neurons. That doesn't make any sense if it's a continuous cell. I can't be getting the data that I'm getting. And so Sir Charles had already named the gaps between the neurons as a synapse. Yes, we do say it incorrectly. Uh, so it's a synapse. And so, and Cajal advanced this neuron doctrine. And he shared the Nobel Prize with Camillo Golgi when, uh, for this neuron doctrine. And I'm given to understand that when you receive the Nobel Prize, you're invited to come and give a lecture. I was disappointed to recently find out that, again, again, my name was not called to go do this. Uh, but at any rate, so uh, Golgi, being the elder of the two, came, got up to go first. And Golgi, when he gave his talk, said, I think this neuron doctrine is wrong. It's just a fad, and it's going to pass. It wasn't science's finest moment. And history records that Cajal was trembling with rage by the time he got to the podium and destroyed Golgi's argument. So we still believe in the neuron doctrine. We still think that cells are separate entities. And what we can see in this particular diagram that Cajal left us is this is a horizontal cut through a brain. And you can see here the axons going from one olfactory bulb coming here and forming the anterior commissure and going out and connecting to the other olfactory bulb. So Cajal's work is still, in just about any neuroanatomy text you'll pick up, you'll get at least one plate from Cajal. We're now going to go and uh, talk, and I'm going to segue into the limbic system. And the way I'm going to segue into this limbic system is to note that there are a couple structures in the limbic system that get direct olfactory input. One of these, as you can see here in this diagram, uh, the olfactory bulbs project directly to the amygdala, which is part of the limbic system. And another projection of the olfactory bulbs are the septal nuclei. Both of these we studied in lab this last week. So both the amygdala and the septal nuclei get projections 
from the olfactory bulb. And I'm going to use this diagram a lot in this lecture. I like, rather like this diagram because it's sort of semi-schematic and it shows you all the connections nicely. By the way, I stuck in this red arrow down here because there really is an arrow here, but it's really hard to see. So I've already mentioned the olfactory bulb connects to the septal nuclei and also to the amygdala, but I guess I should talk to you a little bit about how we came across this idea of a limbic system. So this actually, in history, uh, there was this guy by the name of Paul Broca. Ever hear of this guy? Broca's area guy? Well, in addition to discovering Broca's area, he talked about the lobe limbique. He was French. And so he was talking about the cingulate gyrus and the entorhinal cortex. And so other people have elaborated on his idea. And there was this other guy by the name of Papes. Did you ever, anybody ever hear the Papes circuit? It's not Papez, by the way. Papes? No? Yes? Okay, well, some people talk about it. So Papes uh, actually was at Cornell, and he got interested in what the heck happens when people contract rabies or dogs or whatever contracts rabies, because you see these profound emotional changes in their behavior. So he started looking at brains to see what part of the brains the rabies virus attacked and destroyed, and he found, well, it's mostly in this circuit, uh, which you see here on the board. And then lastly, there is this guy by the name of Paul McLean, and he came up with this, this idea of a limbic system. He came up with another idea, uh, which... Uh, is that triune brain. You ever hear of this thing, too? Uh, it's where you have a, a reptilian brain, and then that's surrounded by a proto-mammalian brain. And then that's surrounded by a mammalian brain. Okay. And this idea is pure... BS. This idea is not very good. And there's no neuroanatomy, actually, that backs up this idea. So if you ever see it, just ignore it. It's not a very good one. Uh, but he did have a good idea about the limbic system. They do seem to be structures that are anatomically and physiologically related. So let's talk to them about them. All right, so let's jump into this discussion first by talking about the olfactory bulb. It projects to the amygdala, and let's talk about the amygdala. You saw the amygdala in your dissections, right? Yes, okay, so there it is, right there. This almond-shaped structure is the amygdala. We think the amygdala is involved in emotions for a variety of reasons. First of all, if you lesion it out, uh, you get an animal that can't be fear-conditioned. So if you lesion the animal and you give it like a, an exposure to tone and shock, most rat, the control rat will just freeze when they hear the tone again. If they've had lesions of the amygdala, uh, they can't be fear conditioned. And so then the question of, well, they don't freeze. So then the question is, well, is it that they can't sit still or is it they can't learn the contingency? What's going on here? Well, it turns out there have been a few rare cases where the amygdala has degenerated in humans. And so what they did essentially was the same experiment on humans. They gave them tone shock, tone shock, tone shock. And so then the question is, well, did, can they learn the contingency? So then they said, okay, do you know what's going to happen when the tone comes on? Said, yeah, I'm going to get a shock. But they don't show any index of fear or distress to the tone. Okay, so it's just like the rat. And, but they do clearly understand the contingency. I used to work with monkeys rhesus monkeys, and whenever I would go into the monkey room, all the monkeys would jump up on their cages and shake them back and forth and display like crazy, and which is monkey language for, come here, I'll kick your ass. All right, so except there was one that had lesions of the amygdala, and this one had a completely different emotional life, you know, and I, he would just sit there very placidly, and He'd see me, and he's, that's all he'd do. 
And we called him Lazarus because he almost died and then he came back. So <laughs> I would say, Lazarus, Lazarus, how are you today? And he would recognize my voice. And then he would jump down and put his head down and his butt up, which is monkey language for you're my friend and my superior. I did not respond in monkey kind. Uh, but he had a very, very different emotional life from every other monkey there because he had his amygdala destroyed. In instances where the amygdala has been stimulated, you can get uh, and sometimes a fear response and sometimes you can get a rage response. Okay? So the animal uh, will be like a Halloween cat. These were usually done in cats. Be like a Halloween cat, it will, all of its hair will be on end, it will be screaming and slashing and things like that. And this kind of behavior actually outlasts the stimulus. So when you shut the stimulator off, they'll stay in this kind of rage response. And that's different. You can get this rage response also from places in the hypothalamus. But in the hypothalamus, as soon as you cut the stimulator, it goes back to being Fluffy the kitty. All right, but with this, the the behavior kind of outlasts the stimulus, which seems like it's more like a full-blown emotion that we'd experience. I mean, when you get really mad, you don't calm down like instantly, right? So it's more like the full-blown emotional experience. Um, the, there was a famous, oh, um, actually, the, as I mentioned to some of you in lab, it has been stimulated in humans. And uh, these were patients with epilepsy. That's why they had electrodes in their brain. And so they did use these to stimulate the amygdala, and apparently it's very aversive. The, in the one case that I read, the guy said, oh, turn this off, turn this off. If you don't turn this off, I'll hit you in the face right now. And so apparently it's very aversive to have this part of the brain stimulated. There is a famous case way back in the 60s where a student uh, in the University of Texas climbed up in the tower with a rifle, uh, like a deer rifle, and started shooting people. Did you ever hear about this? No, it was a, it was a long time ago. Anyway, they finally, to stop this, uh, actually I think it was interesting from a social psych standpoint, because people were walking across this big green, and people were literally falling dead next to them, and nobody panicked and ran. Okay, it's like they didn't understand, or couldn't understand what was happening. So, but at any rate, to stop this guy, they finally had to storm the tower. The police had to storm the tower and shoot him dead. And turned out he had a big tumor on his amygdala. Hmm. Okay. The amygdala has a couple of big deal outputs, and one is to the, if we trace this tract around, which we didn't get to see, it's hard, kind of hard to see in our dissections, unless you know exactly where to look. But there's this big axonal tract called the stria terminalis that connects the amygdala to the hypothalamus. And recall, you can get emotional responses like fear and rage out of the amygdala. And guess what? You can get emotional responses like fear and rage out of stimulating the hypothalamus, too. I should point out here that the hypothalamus is technically not part of the limbic system, but it has a lot of connections with the limbic system. Inputs and outputs, yeah. Not to my knowledge. So, one way. Okay, uh, the other output of the amygdala is to this entorhinal cortex, which we also saw in lab. And here, again, now here again is the piriform area, and this part of the piriform area that I'm now tracing, and we have this label on, this is the entorhinal cortex. I'm going to come back and talk about this entorhinal cortex uh, in context of talking about the hippocampus, because it turns out the entorhinal cortex, as you can see back in this slide, has projections to the hippocampus, and it turns out that that's really important. But I'm going to segue over now and start talking about the hippocampus. And this is a slide I stole from Dr. Knowlton, so uh, you may get to see this slide later again in this course when she's the lecturer. Um, but 
you probably heard about the memorable case of H.M. We now know that his name is Henry Meliason. And so H.M. had severe grand mal epilepsy. You all familiar with grand mal epilepsy? Any French speakers? Nobody took French. What's it mean? Big bad. Yeah, so big bad epilepsy. And grand mal epilepsy is when you have a seizure that involves the whole body, okay, the big bad epilepsy. And I, I once looked it up, the number of seizures he was having per day was about one every five minutes, okay. So he was severely afflicted with this grand mal epilepsy. And so what they do when they're trying to diagnose this further is they do EEGs and try to figure out where's the epileptic focus. Okay, and let me talk about that. So I'm going to crudely draw HM's brain from the looking at, say, the dorsal surface. And so what they figured out was that the focus of, this, of these seizures, where these seizures were starting, it was in the hippocampus. And did you all talk in other courses about what a seizure is even in the brain, what epilepsy is? No, okay, so what's happening is uh, in a seizure, all the neurons start firing synchronously, okay? And they're not supposed to do that. That's not what neurons are, you know, that's not how the system's supposed to operate. They all start making action potentials at the same moment. When that happens, of course, that kind of activity is going to keep recruiting other neurons to get, also get synchronous, and it's going to keep spreading across the whole brain. So what they figured out was that, this, that in his hippocampus, he had this epileptic focus, all right? So that's where these seizures are starting. Now, the bad news is that there are lots of commissures in the brain, and one we didn't study, but one that also exists is something called the hippocampal commissure. So going from right hippocampus to left hippocampus. And when you have commissural fibers, then these axons are going to cause what's called a mirror focus. So in the opposite side of the brain, you're going to also get a, a focus where the epileptic seizures are starting. Okay? And these neurons will get sensitized, and also this part of the brain, the, on the other side, the other hemisphere, will also become a center of epileptic activity. All right? So both sides become diseased. So what they decided to do was to remove HM's hippocampus bilaterally because he had this mirror focus too. So they went in and took it out. And I was surprised to learn uh, as I was getting this lecture ready that HM was about the 25th person to receive this surgery. And they had never ever before detected this memory deficit that he suffered from. You know why? The other 24 were all schizophrenics. Okay, so it's hard to get really good responses out of them. Uh, like, you know, if you ask them, you know, standard kind of memory questions like, what'd you have for breakfast? You could get any kind of train of thought, you know. So they didn't pick it up in these other 24 people. It, did anybody see the soloist? Oh, go rent. It's probably out of theaters by now. Go, go rent it. There's a guy in there who's a schizophrenic. He's talking to a correspondent from the LA Times and you know they're trying to have a conversation and all of a sudden an, an airplane goes overhead and then the, the schizophrenic guy looks at us are you on that airplane you know and so you know if they have those kinds of trains of thought you're not going to figure out if they have a memory deficit or not so they didn't figure it out HM didn't have anything wrong with him except for his epilepsy and the really bad news was surgery didn't completely cure it uh, that's another untold story, but the surgery didn't completely cure it. Anyway, they started studying this guy because he had this severe anterograde amnesia. Here's a picture of him, by the way. He died last December. Uh, and so he's got this severe anterograde amnesia. And so he, what that means was he's having trouble forming new long-term memories. So, for example, his family moved down the block he would go home. Actually, he was a professional subject after this. He couldn't hold a job. And so he would go to the wrong house every day, okay, and they'd have to send him to the right house. 
in the clinic that he visited every day, he never learned where the bathroom was. They always had to lead him to the bathroom. Okay. Um, some other things. Uh, he could read the same magazine over and over and over again because he never remembered seeing it before. Um, they could tell him that his favorite uncle died every day, every day. He'd be grief-stricken because he couldn't code this fact. Uh, so he had severe anterograde amnesia. Surprisingly enough, um, he could learn some things. So his ability to, to kind of code episodic memories uh, was impaired, but his ability for procedural memories seemed pretty much intact. So he learned to play a game. Are you too young to have ever seen Pac-Man? So you saw Pac-Man, okay. So he learned to play Pac-Man, and every day his score would improve, all right? So that suggests he remembers something about this game, right? They take him up to the machine and say, here you go, Henry, remember this? No, I don't remember this. But he could keep improving at Pac-Man. But that's got more like a procedural memory. And they could give him certain puzzles, like there's a puzzle called the Tower of Hanoi, where you have to stack rings on top of other rings. You can never have a big ring on top of a little ring, but you have to move all the rings across using these rules. He could, figure, he could learn the solution and do it, okay? So his procedural memory was pretty much intact. But his ability to form new sort of episodic memories was severely impaired. Now, for a long time, at least when I was your age, uh, we were having, uh, biological psychologists were having a really tough time trying to replicate this memory deficit in animals. Uh, when we would lesion the hippocampus. So we'd lesion the hippocampus and stick them back in a maze that they'd learned, and you know, they were fine, okay? And, or, you know, bar pressing, you know, fine. But the problem with that is we were mostly giving the animals procedural tasks, and so HM actually wasn't impaired as procedural tasks, and we were giving these animals mostly procedural tasks. So what we needed to do was find some sort of task that had uh, a more episodic kind of flavor. So uh, what we came up with, and what I used to test my monkeys on, was something that's called a delayed non-matching to sample task. Anybody ever hear about this? Okay. So uh, what, what I do with these monkeys is, uh, let's see, I need, I need a good monkey. You look like you'd make a great monkey. All right. All right. So... Um, what we do, first of all, is we had some, we would put objects in, so the monkey, actually the object covered a well, so the monkey would have to touch the object and knock the object away to get the treat, which was under the well. Okay, so there's an acquisition trial, and there's a little screen where uh, it's kind of like a one-way mirror, so I can see the monkey and the monkey can't see me, because if the monkey could see me, the monkey would spend the whole time making faces at me, and so they wouldn't ever pay any attention to anything else. So first of all, we give an acquisition trial, and the monkey's got to bop it, just push it away, and we, by the way, we always had strings on them, otherwise the monkeys think they have a toy for the rest of the session. All right, so the monkey pushes it away, and then the monkey gets a treat. There you go. All right. And so then we lower, lower a door, and then after a delay... We present the monkey with two objects, and the monkey has to pick the new one. Okay, so the monkey now gets another treat. All right, so that's a delayed non-matching to sample task, and that has kind of an episodic nature. So um, what we would keep doing was, was varying the objects. So we had like a sample of like 250 objects that the monkey could see. All right, so, and the delay could be anywhere from just a few seconds to hours. And normal monkeys... Certainly across four hours, they can tell you exactly what they saw four hours ago, no problem. And sometimes even eight hours, no problem, they could tell you. The guys that had the hippocampal damage, here's a hippocampus again in a sheep, but the monkeys that had damage to their hippocampus, they couldn't tell you beyond just a couple minutes. They would start choosing randomly, so they didn't seem to remember. So when we developed tasks like that, we could get a model that, where we could replicate this deficit that HM had in monkeys. Now I'm going to tell you 
the real, not in the book story of HM. And before I do this, I'm going to tell you that, yes, if you destroy the hippocampus, you do get anterograde amnesia. I'm not overturning this fact, okay? But there was this guy who got interested in the fact that to get to HM's hippocampus, which they sucked out with a little aspirator, by the way, to get to it, they had to suck out his entorhinal cortex, okay? So this guy was studying, this guy's name was Mort Mishkin, and he studied monkey memory mechanisms at NIMH. And what he did was he, he said, okay, let's selectively suck out the entorhinal cortex or selectively destroy the hippocampus. And let's see what really makes a difference. So he selectively destroys the entorhinal cortex, and these monkeys had a severe anterograde amnesia. They really couldn't do that delayed matching to sample task anymore at all. Okay? And if he selectively destroyed the hippocampus, then they also showed an impairment, but not as severe as with entorhinal damage. Okay? So OLHM, of course, had both entorhinal cortex damage and damage to his hippocampus. And then it kind of made people wonder, well, what the heck actually happened with that surgery? So towards the end of his life, they gave HM a scan, and they found out that, yep, his entorhinal cortex, gone. And about two-thirds of his hippocampus is still in there. Okay? So we don't know for sure, because we don't have a control group on HM, but it could be that a lot of his deficit was due to his entorhinal damage and some, at least, to his hippocampal damage. Okay, so as you can see in this diagram, the entorhinal cortex uh, synapses, uh, sends axons, sends projections to the hippocampus. And then uh, we've talked about the hippocampus being involved in memory, as in the case of HM. And if you blow it out in rats, you get really bad spatial memory deficits. And we talked about in lab that the hippocampus sends projections to where? Septal nuclei. Okay. And the axons that connect the hippocampus with the septal nuclei are called the what? Fornix. So this septum, by the way, means the septal nuclei. So these, ac these are axons going from the hippocampus to the septal nuclei. And one of the septal nuclei sends axons back to the hippocampus via the fornix. And here in our sheep brain, here in this mid-sagittal section, you can again see this fornix arching down. Some of these axons will stop, and about where this arrowhead is, that's where they will synapse. That's being the septal nuclei. Here now in the coronal section, we saw the septal nuclei, or excuse me, the fornix again in the coronal section. Right there inside the lateral ventricle. And then now we also recall saw the septal nuclei, which is this gray here in the coronal section. And in lab, I told you stories about the septal nuclei, about when I destroyed them in rats and my rats became incredibly mean and nasty crazy, okay? So we think the septal nuclei are involved in emotions. And the other reason why we think the septal nuclei are involved in emotions is that electric, rewarding electrical stimulation of the brain was first discovered in this site. Did you talk about rewarding electrical stimulation in 115? <laughs> Yes and no, some people say. All right, so if you stick an electrode in the septal nuclei and you hook it up so that the stimulator will be set off when the rat pushes a bar, rats will push that bar and just love it. All right? And in fact, they will push that bar until they are exhausted and pass out. And when they wake back up, Ooh, yeah, I'm going to go right back for it, all right? 
uh, and if you give them a bar where they can press this for electrical, rewarding electrical stimulation of the brain and another bar which they can press for food, they will starve to death getting the electrical stimulation for the brain. Okay, they'll literally starve themselves even though food's readily available. It's just that good. This electrical stimulation of the brain, this was found by a, a famous paper or a famous couple of guys, Olds and Milner. way back. And I'm going to tell you the story that never made the books on this one, too. So um, I'm going to skip a couple slides to do this. So uh, Olds had this theory that um, if, all right, so the prevailing theory in psychology then was that all behavior was motivated by drive, and satisfying drives was what was rewarding. And this is kind of gone now, but this is the prevailing theory. So what Old thought was, geez, if I could just get an animal where I could make it in a completely drive-free state, that ought to be incredibly rewarding, right? And so he thought, all right, and he's reading some stuff by these guys here at UCLA, who were finding things back in the brain stem where they, they thought that you could just completely knock an animal out. So he thought, if, you know, if I could stimulate some of these sleep centers back in the brain stem and just completely knock the animal out of a drive state, completely out of a drive state, that ought to be incredibly rewarding. So what he sought out to do was to stick some electrodes way back here in the brain stem. Well, he'd never done surgery on rats before, and some of you were asking me, how do, we, how do we know where to put the electrodes to destroy something or stimulate? We have a three-dimensional atlas of the rat brain, okay? And so Olds wanted to stick electrodes way back here in the brain stem, but he reversed the anterior-posterior coordinates, okay? And so instead of going back, he went forward. This, by the way, is not in any textbook, all right? So instead of sticking the electrodes down here in the brain stem, he stuck them in the septal nuclei. And so I actually knew somebody who was in the lab that morning. And so she said she came in and here all these rats bar pressing away for this stimulation of the brain. So there's no food coming out, there's no water, no drives are being reduced, but they really love the stimulation of the brain. So she cut the brains for Olds and was teaching him some neuroanatomy as they went. So they looked for the electrode tracks back here in the brain stem. Didn't find them. Like, well, okay, well, we'll cut the rest of the brain and teach you some more anatomy. And then they finally found them up here in the septal nuclei. So he got rid of this theory about drive reduction and everything and, and turned out to have a great career uh, talking about the electrical stimulation of the brain and the septal nuclei. By the way, there are some places down in the hypothalamus that are even hotter for electrical stimulation of the brain. All right, so we think the septal nuclei are involved in, in emotions. And if you turn it on, uh, it's very rewarding. If you put it, do that in kitty cats, they'll start purring. Uh, their ears get really pink. And rats, they'll absolutely keep pressing at high rates. All right, so uh, the other... Okay, so hippocampus connect... It projects to the septal nuclei. Where else does the hippocampus project to? Mammillary bodies. Okay? And so again, this is the fornix, and this fornix is going to go all the way down. Some of these axons bypass that septal nuclei, and they're going to go all the way down to the mammillary bodies where they'll synapse. And here is a view of the mammillary bodies in the ventral aspect of the brain, and we also talked about a syndrome in humans, um, and that where these deteriorate. What's that syndrome? Korsakoff's. All right, and uh, here is another slide that I stole from Dr. Knowlton, so you may see this one also. Um, but this one talks about Korsakoff syndrome. Again, it's caused by thiamine deficiency, chronic alcoholics, and it's characterized by severe anterograde amnesia as also similar to that which you see with hippocampal damage. And as you can see, this is a really a great slide because you can see these arrows are pointing to the mammillary bodies 
and you can actually see even at a gross level the deterioration of these mammillary bodies. Now the problem with uh, our inference from people who have Korsakoff syndrome is there's always some other damage to other areas of the brain. So you don't know is it specific to mammillary bodies or other areas of the brain or you have to have both or what. Okay, so uh, we have actually a case which is an unfortunate control and this will teach you not to get in fights in bars. Uh, this guy got in a fight uh, with somebody who was wielding a snooker cue, a, a pool cue, and stuck it up through his mouth or head or something and lesioned his mammillary bodies. Yeah, not such a, not his best friend, I would hope. Uh, and so here we have pretty much a selective lesion where the mammillary bodies were destroyed, and this guy also showed severe anterograde amnesia. Okay, so we're pretty sure then that it's due to damage of the mammillary bodies. Okay, the cell bodies of the mammillary bodies in turn are going to project to the anterior nucleus of the thalamus. Okay, and the tract connecting the mammillary bodies to the anterior nucleus of the thalamus is called the what? Mammilothalamic tract. So that's not in this diagram, but could you please add it? Okay, mammilothalamic tract. And in looking up the anterior nucleus of the thalamus, I couldn't find very many papers, but I did find one that uh, talked about lesions of the anterior nucleus of the thalamus and looking at rats in a radial maze. Now, I, I'm given to understand you guys have never heard of radial mazes and this kind of thing. All right. So, upon some occasions, you guys are not going to get this, but sometimes Dr. Knowlton runs this lab in 116. And what we have is a radial maze, okay, which is a maze that has, uh, should have eight arms. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay. So, an eight-arm radial maze, and at the end of each arm, we stick a rat treat. So usually a quarter of a Fruit Loop is just dandy as far as they're concerned. So in every arm at the very end where they can't quite see it, there's a little dish and there's a quarter of a Fruit Loop. Okay? And so what we do is we build in kind of a memory test for the rats. So we have these so we can randomly uh, block off some of the arms. So on every trial, four of the arms get blocked. Okay, just randomly chosen. Okay, so the rat goes in, and rats learn this pretty readily. They learn, okay, I go get my Fruit Loops, and they also learn, don't go down an alley where you already got a Fruit Loop because there's no Fruit Loop there. All right, does that make sense? So you let them go down those four arms, and then you take them out, and then you give them the memory test, and then you have a little tiny delay, and you stick them back in. If they can remember where they've been, they'll go down the arms that were blocked and get a Fruit Loop. Okay? Does that make sense? All right. So this is kind of a memory test for rats. If you give rats damage to the anterior nucleus of the thalamus, they have a lot of trouble with this. So it's kind of like they're lost in space. <laughs> and similarly, actually, if you damage the hippocampus, give them a task like this, they're not very good at it. Again, like they can't remember where they've been. They don't have any episodic kinds of memories. Okay. Anterior nucleus of the thalamus projects to the cingulate cortex, which is the same. Oops, let's see. Do I have some slides here that I got to show you? Yeah. So there's the mammilothalamic tract before I go on to the cingulate. So that's going up. These axons are coming from the mammillary bodies. They're, we're here at the anterior nucleus of the thalamus. This gray ball is the thalamus. And these axons are spraying around in this picture to synapse. And then, I got a little ahead of myself, anterior nucleus of the thalamus projects to the cingulate cortex or cingulate gyrus. And the cingulate cortex or cingulate gyrus is also part of the limbic system. 
I told you some stories in lab about uh, MRIs. So uh, when people are in conflict, this anterior end gets really active. When they look at someone they love, this part that lops under the corpus callosum gets really active. Uh, if, you, if it's lesioned in humans, people who have obsessive compulsive disorder get better. Uh, and if you lesion it in rats, things like maternal behavior get disrupted. So we used to do tests where we'd put a rat, we let her live in a big arena, big box, and have her pups. And then on the test, we'd take them out, and then you scatter the pups all over, and you stick her back in. And she, if they have lesions of the cingulate gyrus, well, a normal rat would run around, grab her pups, stick them back in the nest, and then nurse them. If they have lesions of the cingulate gyrus, they go over and they grab a pup, walk a couple steps, drop it, and then they look around and there's another pup. And they go over, grab the other pup, walk a couple steps, drop it. So their maternal behavior is disrupted, which probably prompted that fMRI study. Okay, uh, lastly, in this limbic system, this that cingulate gyrus, which is on here on the medial side, actually wraps around and connects to that entorhinal cortex and sends projections to that entorhinal cortex. So here, as you can see in this diagram, the cingulate cortex wraps around and, and connects to that entorhinal cortex. Okay, questions on limbic system? All right. We're going to do a little blitz through something that we've already talked about, and that's the corticospinal tract. All right, so here, here we have a gyrus represented. Which gyrus would that be? Come on. Precentral gyrus, okay? What lobe is it in? Frontal. Whew. Glad we had this chat. <laughs> okay. Uh, what subdivision of the brain? Talencephalon. Okay. On this precentral gyrus, you can see they have this motor homunculus. Okay, a motor homunculus. And so you can also see it's a disarticulated map of your body. So here's the tongue and, and face and then the hands and arms and then the necks back here and then the trunk and foot back here. These axons, as they're coming right off of that precentral gyrus, they're going to be forming part of what? Corona radiata, okay? And what we see then is these axons are going to form a bundle and they're going to then form part of this structure, which is shown in horizontal cut now. And this is the internal capsule, okay, which you also saw, right? And actually, this shows you that it's, it's going to form what's called the posterior limb of the internal capsule. And then these axons are going to descend, and down here, in the brain stem, here in the mesencephalon, these axons will form this structure, which is what? Cerebral peduncle, good. They're going to shoot through the pons, and then they're going to come out as this structure right here. Okay? And this structure right here is what? Pyramids, okay? And what happens here? Decusation, which means what? Crossing of fibers, all right? And pyramids are in what subdivision? Myelencephalon, okay? These axons are, and when, after they decussate, they're going to go through the lateral spinal cord, and then finally, they're going to end up where? And synapse where? Ventral horn, thank you. All right, so I got one more minute, and I'm going to show you a little clinical trick. Jennifer, can I prevail upon you? All right, so... We talked about, up here, you've got to get up here on the exam table, please. All right, we talked about uh, what happens when you have upper motor neuron lesions versus lower motor neuron Here, sit. Okay, I think this will hold both of us. We'll hope. All right, so I need your foot. Sand sandal. Wait, without? Without the sandal, yeah. All right, so, all right, so 
Now, let's talk. Okay, muscle tone here is fine. So what's okay about her and don't be rude? All right, what's okay if her muscle tone is fine? It's at least it's not, her limb is not floppy. What about the spinal cord? <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Which, spinal, which part of the spinal cord is okay? Banter horn, thank you. All right, now what I'm going to try to do, and I'm not always successful because I'm not a clinician, is I hope you have really ticklish feet. No, this ain't going to work. All right, so what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to elicit a Babinski reflex by stroking her feet, okay? And if, if her motor areas are intact, uh, what you'll see, if your brain is intact, your feet, your toes will flex forward. Got it? All right. Now, should she have an upper motor neuron lesion, her toes will splay backwards, okay? And that's a, what's called a Babinski sign, Babinski sign. All right. And if you get a baby be well before they walk, I tried this on mine, you have to get them well before they walk. <laughs> the baby, when you stroke the, the plantar surface, the, the surface of their foot, <laughs> they will splay their toes backwards, but as their corticospinal tract hooks up, the toes will go forwards. Okay, so I'm going to try to get... Oh, it ain't working. <laughs> She's in agony, but I'm not getting the reflex. All right. Well, anyway, thank you very much, and uh, thank you for your kind attention. <laughs>